We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, it's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home using paint, power tools, and of course, thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 15 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. And today we're talking about mold. What are those things that you think you know about mold, but you really have no idea? You think just a little bit of bleach is gonna solve your problem? Well, in this episode, I learned, and you will learn, that's not quite the case. Today we're talking to Michael Rubino. He's an author of a book called The Mold Medic. It's actually not even a long book. It's more of like a guide for homeowners who live in a home that may have had water damage. He tells you all the things you need to know to look for mold. And we're gonna talk about that today. And also we're talking about places where you may not even realize there's mold. And are all these particles floating around? Is it making you sick? How do you handle the mold once you find mold? So we're gonna talk about all of those things today. He's a mold remediator from a company that he owns called All American Restoration. And he gave us about an hour of his time to sit down and talk about this very important topic called mold. So let's take it away with episode 15. So I am talking with Michael Rubino today. He is the president of All American Restoration. And I'm really excited to talk to you today, Michael, because everything that we do here at Thrift Diving it's it's all about the home. You know, I was telling you a little bit before we started is here at Thrift Diving, it's about decorating, improving, but there's a little part that I don't talk about enough. And I've noticed that I've been having more conversations. It's about maintaining your home. So just yeah. to give you an, an idea, we've talked about in previous episodes, we've talked about home insurance. And I know that's something that you have in your book. You wrote this amazing little guide here. It's called The Mold Medic an expert's guide on mold removal. And we will have links down below for that. But you talk about insurance and you've got some important information that you're going to share with us about mold remediation, what's real, what's not, what are the myths surrounding mold and how that relates to your health and also maintaining your home. And insurance may or may not cover some of this. (laughs) So here at Thrift Diving, it's really about all of these things that make home safe, and healthy and really be in the oasis that you want, especially in this time, right? So let me welcome you to the Thrift Diving Podcast. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes. So tell me a little bit about why you got into mold remediation and how did you become the the president of All American Restoration? So you must love mold. Tell us about mold and how you got started. What, you mean everyone doesn't get into mold remediation? (laughs) (laughs) No, we only Um, freak out at the idea of like, oh my gosh, I just found mold in my house. What do I do? (laughs) Yeah, no, it's true. You know, I've been around construction my entire life, and that's really how I got my start into this journey here. My dad's been a uh, restoration contractor since I'm five years old. He started off as a master electrician, became a general contractor, and was working a lot on uh, restoring homes that have had fires. And if you can imagine, they put out fires with a ton of water and we know water equates to mold typically. So um, when I started working with him just on and off between schooling, younger years, high school, and then after college, I came back and started working for him full time. I really got to see that side of things. Just in, in all the interactions that I had working there, I quickly realized that there was a, a big missing piece to mold as it relates to people's health and just the overall way that the insurance industry handles it. I started you know, seeing people get sick, especially considering right after college is when Hurricane Sandy happened in the Northeast mm-hmm. where I'm from. So I, I got to see, unfortunately, too many tragic events to where I just started to become obsessed with it. And um, you know, like anything else, when you become obsessed with something, you start to learn every little detail about it until you can, you know, build a better mousetrap, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the things that you were finding after Hurricane Sandy? Because I can imagine there's all these people who didn't have insurance. Now they've got all this destruction. They're trying to rebuild. They're trying to salvage not just their home, but all the belongings in their home. What did you find with that? And how did you help people? So for seven years after Sandy, I was still getting calls from people who had been quote unquote remediated 
Wow. That we're not feeling well. And we're like, I, I need some help. I understand you guys do remediation. I have a feeling that there's still mold here. And so I began working with mold inspectors that can help locate it. And then I was, you know, working under my father's company's umbrella. I was doing mold remediation. I became certified through the ACAC. Once New York State issued the license, I became licensed through the New York State. That's how I started getting the ball rolling. What I started realizing was very basic elementary science that was being totally missed in the restoration space. And it's basically, they thought that just by removing the drywall and spraying a chemical like bleach, for instance, that Mm -hmm. you were solving the problem. And so they were doing that really fast, putting drywall back. And what would happen was a year or two down the road, you know, as a client started to notice a health decline, they started to basically get people in there to identify what was going on. When we reopened up these areas that were supposedly remediated, what we found was black mold all behind the drywall. On the front side of it, it looked fine. Wow. You know, and they're like, I don't, I, they're like, something isn't right here. I just, I don't mm-hmm. feel well. And so we opened it up as an inv- investigatory basis. And what we found was that the mold had come back and, and honestly, probably mm-hmm. tenfold with a vengeance. And, um, you know, to me, it didn't make sense, right? So I really started diving into what are we missing here as an industry? There's something here that we're missing. And I started really diving into the fact that I think most remediation companies don't realize they're dealing with a living organism, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. I think they just think it's this thing that you remove it, you spray some chemicals and it's gone. They certainly don't understand that mold as a living organism, it's constantly reproducing by methods of spores. I I love this analogy. It's similar to how weeds reproduce by methods of seeds, right? Mm -hmm. They they both get aerosolized and wherever they find a a spot of moisture, they begin to grow and colonize again. So it's just exactly like weeds, except the weeds are happening on your front lawn, mold happens inside your house, right? So look at it as the weed of the home that you do not want involved, (laughs) right? And so when I realized that like, okay, we have these spores, you know, I start looking at all the guidebooks. I'm like, you know, they really don't talk about removing the contamination. Like there's no mention of if you have mold in your living room, you should probably clean your HVAC because your HVAC likely has these spores from your living room. They don't talk about that. They don't Mm -hmm. talk about really dealing with the contents of the home. They just talk about the one little room, just deal with that room and you're good. And it's, it's, it couldn't be further from the truth. And so as I started realizing this, I'm like, well, we're not remediating properly. That's why people are, are, are getting sick because mold just coming right back. And we're certainly not dealing with the stuff in a preventative measure so that, again, mold doesn't grow back. And so when you look at all these pieces, I'm like, there's a big problem with this industry. So I started really creating my own protocols. And from there, I've helped over a thousand families who are sensitive to mold get back into their house. These are people that were told before, set the house on fire, walk away. There's nothing you can do. You are just one of those unfortunate people. And I've realized that that is not true. It is the industry that has failed all of these people. Mm-hmm. So what are the things that people complain to you about that they're feeling? I know in your book, you know, you, you talk about leaky gut and you talk about the immune system. And I think we'll touch on that yeah. a little bit here. But the first question that I thought about as I was reading your book was, how do you know that you don't feel good if you don't really even know what feeling good is? And the reason why I say that is because if you think of it from a food perspective. If we eat, I don't want to just say junk food, but let's say there's foods that you're eating that you're sensitive to that you don't even realize, oh, that little bit of pain that I have in my wrist or my knee. Oh, I didn't realize that was from something I'm eating that I'm sensitive with. You just tend to get used to it and you don't realize you're having an effect. So if you're living in a house that has tons of, well, I don't mean, let's, let's not even say tons of mold, because from what I've learned, it just takes a little bit and you could be extra sensitive. Sure. But how do you know that you are having symptoms that's related to mold? How does someone determine that that's what's causing their problems? Well, it's very difficult, as you mentioned. Because you can't do an elimination diet. You can't you do an elimination diet, weeks. right. <laughs> it's, very, it's very difficult to diagnose because the symptoms are so much like so many other symptoms. You know, chronic brain fog is mm-hmm. something that I hear a lot about where you're struggling to put together, to string together words into a sentence. Mm -hmm. You're like doing something and losing your train of thought and not even remembering what you were looking for, what you were trying to do, things like that. You have um, allergy-like symptoms where you constantly feel like you're having some sort of allergic reaction. 
which allergies in general just means any foreign substance that comes into your body that produces an adverse reaction. You got skin issues, skin rashes, the onset of a cold that just never goes away. You have chronic headaches, chronic fatigue. These are joint pains, stomach those pains. Just, those, <laughs> those, yeah, those describe a lot of symptoms that yeah. the first thing that comes to my mind are two things, food sensitivities, and also mm-hmm. too with COVID. People who yep. are having these long hauler experiences, brain fog and possible skin rash. I mean, I don't know if skin rashes is a COVID thing, but now you have all these other confounding things that makes it even more difficult. So where would a person start if they're like, you know what, I know for a fact in the past, I've had problems with water because I can tell you my experience. I have had leaks in my basement and I've had a little bit of, well, I say a little bit, but it could have been a lot of mold that I tried to clean up myself, which after reading your book, (laughs) I should have had your book first. But (laughs) if someone wants to start there, is there like a checklist? Like, have you had water intrusion before? Yes. Did you notice mold? Yes. Like, what are the questions that people would ask to decide, okay, I, I think I need to get a mold test. And how would that actually work? No, it's great. I'm actually putting together a checklist for this very reason. It's a really good idea. Um, we're going to do have like a free checklist we're going to put on our website online. Basically, there's a couple of different things. One, you want to look for those coffee-like stains that are either on your ceilings or walls. If you've ever been to an office that had a leak or something, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> Looks like you spilled a cup of coffee. That's a sign of water intrusion. If you have any musty odor at all anywhere, that's a sign of water intrusion which, you know, typically water intrusion is going to lead to mold growth. Now, the, one of the myths about mold is that it takes weeks or months or years for mold to start growing. It can grow in as quickly as 24 to 48 hours. And mm. just to give you an idea, because normally people think, oh, I had a minor leak. It was very minor. It definitely dry within 24 to 48 hours. Well, let's go back to science really quickly. If you take a wet sponge and you leave it on the counter, that moisture stays in between two substrates for a very long time, likely longer than 24 to 48 hours. So all of our houses are built with either, you know, metal studs, two by fours, concrete walls, anything that's resting against another substrate is going to trap the moisture there for far longer. So that one little quick leak could have had, if you didn't specifically force dry it with like a dehumidifier, it could have stayed wet longer than 24 to 48 hours. So I wanted to touch on that really quickly. The other amazing sign that I love, and uh, it brings a really good visual, is check your toilet bowl. Go over to your toilet bowl, lift Uh the cover of the tank off, flip it over, Mm -hmm. look on the underside of the tank. And if you see any mold growing, that's usually a sign that there's mold somewhere in the house. And again, Mm -hmm. as it provides that opportunity, what happens is when you have mold growing in your house, it's producing those spores at a specific rate, depending on how big the colony is. And the more that's in the air, the more opportunity where you have more sure water, such as a toilet bowl tank, if it happens to land in there, it's going to start growing. So if it's growing inside the tank or on the underside of the lid, that's a good sign. Hey, there could be mold somewhere else producing at that rate where the opportunity Mm. falls in there. So you'd want to take a look at that and get an inspection at that point. Also, you want to, you know, probably check your HVAC, make sure your HVAC is clean. A lot of us don't even remember to change the filter every three months like we're supposed to. Oh, uh, yeah. So, you know, the HVAC is like the lungs of the home. It's yeah. super important to maintain and pay attention to the HVAC because once that gets contaminated, that becomes a mold factory fairly quickly because the coil, it constantly condensates. So it's a constant source of moisture and water where if mold gets to that coil, it starts to grow around it. I've seen it a hundred thousand times. And it just becomes Mm -hmm. a mold factory. And now that's the air you're breathing in primarily. So, you know, those are the the main points you want to take a look at. If you have any of those issues, definitely get a mold inspection. Yeah, those are good points. Now with the HVAC, you you know how you get those calls. I don't know about you, but I get calls all the time from people who've come and serviced the HVAC years ago, and they still have you on the call list. And they're like, hey, we're going to be in the area. We're going to come by and do an inspection. Those inspections that we get, with the HVAC company, let's say every season or twice a year, is that something that they come in to do? Are they coming in to clean? Is that part of their routine inspection? Or is that something separate that maybe a mold remediator will come in to look, but is there something that they're doing in order to clean that? If there's a well, problem? Well, you know, in theory, see if there is a problem. 
Yeah, in theory, I feel like they should be, but I don't really think they are. <laughs> I've heard some good stories about clients telling me, you know, so and so pointed out some mold in their HVAC, recommended a remediator come in. But for the most part, I don't really think that they are. And I think that's part of the problem. You typically need to search out like a NADCA certified duct cleaning contractor in order mm-hmm. to actually get the ducts cleaned appropriately. And NADCA is the only real certification that I know for duct cleaners that has anything to do with mold at all, that teaches them the, the negative air pressure that's required to remediate duct work and, and machinery. So it's really the only thing that I know of certification wise that, that actually teaches people and certifies them properly for duct cleaning. You, do you remember the Sears $99 duct cleaning forever? Yes. Uh, let me tell you, those guys were not NADCA certified. <laughs> and if you've ever experienced one of those things, it was om- almost comical. These guys, Mm -hmm. like actually the NACA people actually come in and do it like really, really right. I mean, if you Google some of their videos and stuff, you'll see they set up containments around each area. They're putting a negative draw. And as they're cleaning the system, they're sucking it out so that it's not escaping into the environment. Now, we all know ductwork. If you know ductwork at all, ductwork is not 100% sealed. It's not a hermetic Mm -hmm. seal. There is typically somewhere between 1% to 3% duct leakage. So- even with the negative draw, even with them doing the best that they possibly can do, you're going to get a very minor amount escaping into the environment. But still, it's far better than if somebody haphazardly just goes in with a vacuum and starts cleaning it. Okay. And what is that that acronym? National the, Air Duct Cleaning Association. If you go on their website, there's usually a link at the top right-hand corner, find a professional. You click that. And you put in your zip code, it'll tell you all the people certified in your area. So I love that tool. Like I give it to people because I I help people all across the country. So I constantly am giving that to people and saying, hey, look, find someone on here. Obviously, make sure you still want to do your due diligence and make sure that you Mm -hmm. like them and you feel that they're a good fit for you. But at least you know that they're technically savvy. So you recommend doing the duct cleaning by someone who's NETCA certified. And how often should they do that? Once a year? You know, I I would say once a year. You know, I would say once a year, once every two years, you can get away with. Sometimes it it could be a little expensive. It could cost, you know, anywhere between a thousand or two thousand dollars to clean, depending on how many systems you have, et cetera. So Mm -hmm. if you want to space that out every two years, that's fine. Just be aware of it. Look at your ductwork. Make sure it looks clean from at least from the the points that you can see. Because if you're noticing dirt and grime at the registers or the supply lines, that means that all that stuff is getting into your ductwork you know you need to get it cleaned. Right, right. So what are some of the common myths that people have about mold? Because I can tell you one of the myths that I had that in reading your book, I was like, oh, I didn't know. So if you think about the fact that something leaks, you clean it up, but remember, like you said, two or three days, you've got mold. Let's say the refrigerator, it's not leaking anymore. We clean that up, we're good. We're good to go. There's no more active leak. The mold is gone. And your book said that's not true. And you said it too. Seven years later, people were still calling with these complaints of not feeling well, and there was still mold in their house. So that's one that I discovered in your book. Are there some other ones that people generally think about mold that's not true? Well, to kind of add to that, a lot of people think that if you solve the source of moisture, that whatever mold is there just dies, like it's gone. You know, that's not true, right? You know, it's not true at all. As a matter of fact, it can go dormant where it's producing less into the air than if it were constantly active, but it's still there, right? And anything can trigger it to to reactivate, such as it's a hot, humid day and your your HVAC is down or you turn it off and you want to open the windows one day, right? Like all of that, now you're adding that humidity factor and it just starts growing and colonizing again. And so if you have mold, you want to remove it. That's the key. If you remove it, it's gone. If it goes dormant, it's still there. It still can impact your health. And, you know, it just may be impacting it less than it previously was. Another myth is like people using bleach to kill mold. Even on the EPA's website, it'll tell you basically you, the objective is not to kill mold. It's to remove it. Mm -hmm. This myth of, of killing it and using chemical products and spraying, or they have this new technology that they're utilizing in our industry called this fogging process where Mm -hmm. we'll fog your entire place of pure acetic acid or, you know, or vinegar, right. And, and, and it'll kill everything. And it's like, 
all it does is it breaks down the outer protein molecule uh, of, of the actual mold spore itself and just breaks it into smaller particles. Mm. And so in order for you to understand why that's not good, we have to take an excerpt out of the American Lung Association. It's also on the EPA's website as well. When you look at the particulate matter section, any particulate smaller than 10 micrometers is a real danger to the health because it's so small that it passes right through the respiratory tract system, which is our self-defense mechanism, blocking particles out, and it immediately enters our bloodstream. So mold happens to be between two and four micrometers. So it is smaller than the 10 micrometers. That's why mold impacts people, right? Forget mm -hmm. about the allergy side of things or the toxicology side of things. Just from that basis alone, we know that mold is not good for our health. So that's really the big problem with that. And so we want to be conscious of the air that we're breathing, right? We want to make sure that these particles are not there. And how do we do that is we don't kill things that produce particles. We remove them so that they no longer produce particles inside of our environment. That's really the, the key to having a healthy approach to the home. So my first question, or not my first question, but I'm thinking from the standpoint of being a DIYer. And, then, okay. and being a homeowner. And I'm thinking about my audience and I'm thinking about who I am when I moved into this home. Someone that doesn't have a lot of money, someone who just bought a house. In fact, we actually had a mildew smell for years. And I know we had some active issues and I tried to treat it myself. But for people that are homeowners that don't have a lot of money, are there some parts of this that they can do themselves? I know that we want to remove it, but let's say for example, maybe they had a leak from, I don't know, a refrigerator or something, and it came down through the basement. And this was actually something that happened to me. If I remove, let's say that section of drywall in the ceiling, replace that within two to three days before it actually starts to create a problem, could I then be assured that, okay, I'm, I'm not going to have a mold problem because of this incident. So does, is it a matter of people just moving more quickly? Yeah. And being able to just treat immediately. But what if they actually don't treat immediately? What if they're listening to this and they're like, oh my gosh, we did have that leak and we thought that we could just put a fan there and everything would be fine. But now I'm listening to this and I'm a little scared. Can I treat this myself? Is there something that I can do as a homeowner that doesn't have a lot of money to pay thousands or hundreds or whatever to have someone come in? Can homeowners treat this and how do they treat it? Sure. So like if a water episode happens in your home and you're catching it, remove all of the wet material, just cut it out. If okay. you're a DIYer, you get a utility knife, you're cutting out the wall assembly, exposing the actual cavity. And again, if it's on an exterior wall, you're going to have insulation. That insulation is going to get wet. Take that wet insulation out, anything that's going to trap moisture and allow it to dry. Now I recommend using a dehumidifier I mean, mm -hmm. even if you go to Home Depot and get like that $100 dehumidifier that you have to empty out the bucket, I mean, that's better than the fans because all the okay. fans do is, is blow stuff around, right? <laughs> and so we don't yeah, know so where the source of water came in. What if the source of water had some bacteria with it, right? If it came, you know, depending on where it comes, comes in from and where it passes through, think about it like this. What if you had a rodent infestation you were not aware of and that water pass through the ceiling cavity and pass through some rodent feces. Now it's got bacteria with it. And now you're blowing that bacteria around the house. You know what I mean? So the fans right. are a no, no, we need to get rid of those fans. Honestly, people need to stop <laughs> buying them. They need to go okay, out of no business. Fans. It's, it's no, because yes. you don't know what you're blowing around, you know? And I think that's the real kicker. And mm -hmm. then I, the dehumidifications, what they're going to do is it's actually going to pull the vapor out of the air and, and, convert it to water and drain it out. So the amount of air that's being moved through there is very minimal compared to these fans that are just blowing the air around. So I think things. it's a much, much better option in terms of just trying to have the best air quality we can in the process. Mm -hmm. You cut out the wet building materials, you dry out the space, but just remember like if the floor gets wet, now you have a floor on top of a floor typically, right? There's something called yeah. a subfloor. Yeah. So the only thing that's going to pull moisture through the wood floor in that scenario is it going to be a dehumidifier. So, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of dehumidifier, there's a, a, a floor extractor, I believe, a water extractor for the floor, I believe that you can rent from somewhere like Home Depot too, mm -hmm. that you may be able to put on top of that space. But again, just getting the water out, if you do that within 24 hours, 
you know you're in the clear. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key for a lot of homeowners is acting on it quickly, as you had said. And I, I know for myself, when I moved into this house and I had shared this story back in episode one, but when we moved in, I was so afraid, Michael, of addressing anything in this house. So when we moved in, there was actually, I can tell you the, the story here, they had actually found mold on the sheathing of the roof. My house has two roofs. We've got like an upper um, hip roof, and then we've got a lower gable roof. And they, th during the inspection, there was some mold found on the sheathing. We didn't know anything about mold. We didn't know anything about owning a home. And so they said, well, the roof is a little old. The homeowners are going to go ahead and replace that. Everything else is as is. Yeah, we bought an as is home. I would never do that again. Mm. <laughs> but they said, okay, we'll go ahead and remove the roof. But nobody had said to me, not even the agent, hey, Serena, you should probably get a mold remediation company in here to make sure that it was done properly, make sure that everything was put back where it needed to be, that there was no more mold. So when we moved in, we still smelled like a mildewy smell. And of course, during the warmer months, you would smell it more than you would during the cooler months. And we also had some problems in the basement. And <laughs> I did a video on my YouTube channel where I tried to address it myself and I sprayed it down, but I also had removed about 12 inches of drywall. Okay. Um, even though there was, I think there was only just, it, it seemed like it was concentrated towards that door. So I tried to remove the subfloor part of, uh, not the subfloor, part of the, uh, oh gosh, my words are escaping me. Um, the bottom plate, the bottom plate okay. of the, the framing. And I realized that the door frame had some mold on it. So I said, oh my gosh, I had to take this thing out. And it took me <laughs> two days to figure out how to get the door in myself. <laughs> but when I did, I did a happy dance. I was excited. But still, just in reading your book, it made me a little fearful because it was an ongoing problem for years and we didn't want to address it because we knew that it was going to be expensive. So we just kind of kept a fan down here. We kept a dehumidifier. And whenever it rained, we just ran downstairs with our fingers crossed. Please let there not be water in, please. There's still some ceiling, some exterior ceiling that I have to do. I feel comfortable though, because the water is not coming in like it, it's not coming in anymore. We may get it if it's a really heavy rain, but generally we don't get water in. But it makes me a little afraid of all the mold that had been in the house or could still be in the house up in the attic because of not having proper mold remediation. So if there's someone listening to this, even myself, who's had issues in the past, what's the next step? How do we find a good mold remediation company to come in to do an inspection? Because from what I'm understanding, for so many years, it's been done wrong. And- yeah there's still companies that are doing it wrong and you're obviously doing it correct. So what should people like myself and other people who've had problems or who may actively be in the middle of a problem, what should we be looking for? Even if we feel like we've solved the problem, which I feel like I've solved the problem, but after reading your book, I'm not so sure. What should we look for in, in having a company come in to make sure that they're thoroughly doing an inspection? So I think it, it really ultimately depends on what the objective is, right? And, I, and I'll give you some scenarios to back that up. I had a gentleman recently call me and was like, hey, can we get a, a price? I'm redoing my kitchen. And as we pulled the cabinets back, we found some mold. Just want to remove that mold. And, you know, and, and so for that, it's like, okay, well, that's pretty simple. Let's cut open the area remediate what's there and put it back. And I started asking him, like, is there any ongoing health effects that you're concerned about? Have you had a mold inspection done? And it was like, no, no, no. I, you know, I don't think I have a problem. I think it's, you know, I just have it there and I just want to get it removed there. So I look at that and saying, okay, so from that standpoint, you're really looking to remove mold from a cosmetic perspective, mm -hmm. not from a, not from an optimizing your health perspective. It's two right. totally different things, right? Because at that point, you're just focusing on making sure the colonization of that mold is gone from the kitchen. We're not even addressing the fact that that mold in the kitchen was producing spores the entire time it's there. It's getting in other places. He wanted nothing to do with any of that, right? And so from a cosmetic standpoint, no problem. This is what you need to do and that's it, right? Now, when you're talking about this like holistic approach, I call it like this whole house holistic approach, mm -hmm. what you're trying to do is you're trying to remediate any sources. And typically a home is going to have a, anywhere between five and 10 sources. And that's going to be a, an alarming figure. You're thinking like, what? Normally it's just like this one thing. No, typically a building, it, for instance, I live in this, this house now, it's been built in the seventies, right? So there, and when your house is built in the seventies, you figure typically the statistic is one leak every 10 years at a, you know, mm -hmm. at a minimum. 
So you're looking at five leaks at, at a minimum. Typically, it's more than that. If your house is built last year, right? There could be mold in it because when they were building, they didn't dry something right or they had a leak. But again, even builders know very little bit about mold. It's mind boggling, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And so they could have done the same thing that homeowners do, right? They just cut it out, put a fan on it, put drywall back, it's done. So no matter how, whether it's brand new or 50 years old, you're going to have some sources. And I would say the average that I go and see is five to 10. Now, Mm. You want to remove all those sources and then remove any contamination that can be created by those sources. And by the way, we haven't even touched on toxins yet, which certain species of mold produced toxins called mycotoxins. And those again need to be removed and could impact your health in a whole different way. So there can be a lot to mold remediation when you're specifically looking at it from a health perspective. But it could be very elementary when you're looking to just remove it from your kitchen. But even that should be done properly so that it doesn't grow back behind your brand new beautiful cabinets. Right, right. So talk a little bit about the toxicity of mold. There's a lot of varieties of molds, but are there certain ones that are worse than others? And are there certain places where you find the really bad mold showing up more than others? So yeah, there's 60 to 100,000 species of mold. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't even know. We, and and, and <laughs> we've studied mold very few, <laughs> I feel, in, in, in comparison to where we need to be. The main molds that we know about, you've heard toxic black mold, which in reference to Stachybotrys. There's Catomium, which is kind of Stachybotrys' cousin. Those two are called toxigenic. It means that they're toxic themselves. And both of those molds can produce mycotoxins, which are, again, toxins are toxic as well, but totally separate and apart from the mold itself. Then you have allergenic species like aspergillus. Aspergillus is closely related to what we know as mildew. It's mm. both from the ascomycota family. We could talk and about that's mildew. that's the stuff we're finding in the bathrooms, right? Like in the bathroom that's and the shower. That's the stuff you're typically okay. finding in the bathrooms. Unfortunately... I'm here to tell you some bad news that mildew is just a nice way of saying mold. It's specifically a family of molds that we happen to call mildew because really the reason we call it mildew is because there's something called powdery mildew that grows typically on plants, which Mm -hmm. again is from that ascomycota kingdom. And basically it's just closely related to the most common form of ascomycota we find indoors is actually aspergillus. And it's typically a white powdery mold, which is what we kind of look at as mildew, these white or gray mm-hmm. powdery mold. So that's typically what we're seeing when we think of mildew. The bad news about that is aspergillus is a mycotoxin producing mold, meaning that it can be toxic, but mm-hmm. it is part of the allergenic species of molds, meaning that it produces typically more allergy-like symptoms, skin rashes, things like that. But if it does produce mycotoxins. And believe me, we know very little about what makes mold produce mycotoxins. We only have some theories, but if it Mm -hmm. does happen to produce mycotoxins for one reason or another, it can be toxic. So I think it's very confusing when you look at mold and we've had so much misinformation out there for so long that it's really hard to put the record straight. But basically, if you have any of the 100,000 species of mold growing inside your home, it's going to be producing particulate, again, smaller than 10 micrometers, that's going to impact the body, you're better off remediating and removing it. Now, there's no set standards on how much particulate is too much particulate. We're probably at the 20 year stage of where we need to be in terms of when I relate this to smoking cigarettes, like it took us 50 years to say, smoking cigarettes is probably not good for us, right? I mean, doctors right. were recommending cigarettes, like exactly. literally forever. Yeah. Right, 50 years. We're like at 20 years into this mold cycle, the way I look at it. We still have 30 years of studying to go, correlation of health, and how, just how do we deal with it, right? right? And so I'm glad to be a part of that you know, cycle and helping push the needle forward. There's a lot left of life here that we need to figure out. And I think it's even more important now because of how much time we're spending indoors because of this pandemic. Yes. And that's why I think that this pandemic is going to impact us in so many ways that we didn't even imagine. Because for some of us that have mold in our homes, if we then go to work, 
I mean, I work at home, but for most people listening to this, if you're working outside the home eight hours a day or whatever, five days a week or more, you're not at home all the time in that toxic environment, but being home all the time or working from home now, you're just exposed to and you're breathing it in and you don't even know. And some of those symptoms you're right that you're having, you you don't even attribute it to mold. You attribute it to seasonal allergies or yeah, yeah my knees always felt like this. And you just don't put two and two together. One thing I wanted to go back to those five to 10 places where you said, okay, if you're, let's say if you're living in an older home, you're going to have five to 10 locations. Yeah. Are there some locations where people have a problem that they don't even know? Cause I know one of those you mentioned was like the front loading washing machine that mm. I've seen that in some of the things. So where are some of those places where people have mold, but they're not even aware that there's a, pr- a problem with mold? Yeah. So household appliances is definitely one of them. And we can go into each of them separately. I put HVAC in there, even though it's not really an Mm -hmm. appliance, but HVAC, um, coffee makers, washing machines, especially the front loaders. Um, and you know, what's interesting about the front loaders too, is you have this compartment where you put the detergents, those can get pretty nasty in, in a spot where mold can grow as well but it's typically around the gasket of the front loading washing machine. If you go on my Instagram and follow me at the mold medic and you see that I did a post on it, it's actually a real life picture of me. (laughs) That's my finger in there. I'm pulling back the gasket to uncover mold that was hidden in the crease because, you know, again, when you open the door, it looks fine. It's what's going on right underneath that. Right. Right. So they make these like washing machine cleaners, dishwasher cleaners. The dishwasher is another one that harms not only mold, but bacteria as well. And, you know, yeah. you wash your plates with this stuff, your utensils, and mm. then you put it right in there and it's spreading more and more bacteria. It's not good. These are all things that we don't think about on a daily basis. The coffee maker, depending on what you have, but they all have these hoses and gaskets. Mm-hmm. And what happens is these gaskets are designed to stop the flow of water. It tells the coffee maker decides... It's, you know, put all the water out there that it's going to put out and it turns on this gasket to stop the flow of water. Well, it also traps moisture and water right in between where the two services are touching. So over time can take years for me. It took four years for my coffee maker that I decided it had to go. It probably had mold before yeah. that point, but it got to the point where I really noticed it. I mean, I took a sip of my coffee and spit it out and was like, oh my God, oh my I'm, gosh. Drinking, I'm drinking a cup of mold right now. <laughs> like it, And it's crazy how the day before I had a normal cup of coffee and then it's just wow. all of a sudden one random is day. That something, is that something that you could actually get to? I mean, I know in the washing machine, you could get to the gasket and clean it out, but yeah. in the coffee maker, can you get to that part? Or is it just, if you've had your coffee maker after a certain number of years, it's probably time to replace it because you can't get to those parts that might have mold. Yeah. You typically can't get to those parts. I mean, every coffee maker is different, obviously, but typically they're hoses that are hidden behind either metal Mm -hmm. or plastic, depending on what coffee maker you have. And they're not serviceable unless you literally take your coffee maker to the service department that the manufacturer Mm -hmm. recommends to take everything apart and make it like new, which at that point, you just buy yourself a new coffee maker. It sounds like a lot of headache, right? Um, you know, I, right. I think I think it, you know it's a it's a time thing. It's not necessarily like how x amount of cups of coffee. I just think that the problem with mold is the opportunity, right? We know there's mm-hmm. a water reservoir. We know that this water passes through these hoses, and we know that oftentimes you're going to have an opportunity for a mold spore to get into that apparatus and and eventually find that water and start to colonize mold. So there's not a lot we can do about it. It just, it's going to happen at some point in time, you know, whether it's two years, three years, four years, it is really going to depend on if you have mold growing inside your home already, or if we're just talking about mold coming in naturally from outdoors, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, that'll really depend on how long it actually lasts. For me, like I said, with knowing that I didn't have mold for four years, it took four years and it just happened. Wow. So what about things that actually get mold on them? And you had mentioned about some things being like a sponge that can suck up that mold. And then there's things like a stainless steel table where you could just clean it off. So are there certain things that we should keep or throw away if it's 
already gotten mold on it. And the reason why I'm thinking of this is because here at Thrift Diving, we love old furniture, like going to the thrift store. And I can't tell you how many times when I've been walking around the thrift store, I see amazing old vintage pieces of furniture and they have mold maybe on the side or in the drawers. Is that something that, I mean, speaking in terms of all of the materials and belongings people can have, but specifically with furniture, if you find a piece of furniture that has mold on it, can you clean that mold off or are there certain parts that maybe you should replace? What are the things we can keep and clean up? And what are the things that you definitely say, look, just get rid of it. Once there's mold, you don't want that thing in your house. All right. So you have three categories. You have what's called non-porous, meaning that there is no porosity to that item. So that's going to be something like glass, metal, or plastic. You're going to have semi-porous, which is going to be wood. And then you're going to have porous, which is like fabric, cushions, anything like cardboard, anything where, you know, if it got wet, it would hold water like a sponge. Right. And so that's what you want to look at. Like we know wood, if it gets wet, it does hold some water. Not a lot, not as much as a sponge, but it will hold some water. We know that if you spill water on a metal or a glass table, the water pools on top of it. It's not being absorbed into the material. Mm -hmm. So that's how we look at it. Now, mold has roots called hyphae that grow into materials. And that's the real harm with that. So anything that mold could be potentially growing into, you can't just wipe it away. It would be like going back to that weeds analogy. It would be like if you just cut the stem off and walked away thinking that you solved your weed problem, the weed would grow right back, right? It's the same thing with mold. It'll just grow right back. So if you have mold inside, let's say a wood dresser and it's an antique, you have to ask yourself, is the wood finished? Because if you finish it with like a lacquer or polyurethane, something like that, you're going to turn that semi-porous substrate into a non-porous substrate. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you can literally wipe it away because it's just, it's on the surface at that point. But if you have like a, I mean, typically antique furniture, they didn't have cardboard. So everything's solid wood, which is amazing. Um, yes. But, it, you know, if you, which is if why you don't, we love it here at Thrift Diving. <laughs> right. And so if you don't have an antique and you have a traditional modern piece of furniture, which has a cardboard back, that cardboard has mold growing on it. You, you got to replace the back of it. And if everything else is finished wood, you can definitely wipe it away. Now, if your furniture happens to be like MDF or that particle board that we just love so much today, yes. that stuff, again, it's too porous. If mold's growing into it, you got to toss it. So it's really about just kind of paying attention to the different porosity of the objects we have and then knowing if mold's growing into those items, if it can be wiped away or if it can't, or sometimes mm-hmm. it is questionable. So let's talk really briefly about insurance. Uh, I know we only have a few more minutes. This is something that was really interesting to me because we had a discussion about insurance. I believe it was episode six. I had an insurance person on and he was talking about all the things that your policy could cover. But if somebody has a water leak and starts having mold growing everywhere, and let's say they've got some belongings that were in a room and suddenly now they've got all these things that are wet, that are porous, that need to be thrown out. What are the times when insurance will cover it? And when are the times when insurance will not cover it? So, you know, it's really interesting because I always go back to this, like what happened first? Well, the water happened first, Mm -hmm. then mold grows second. And so I've had a fight with insurance adjusters about this. They're like, well, we only have a $10,000 mold cap and this is more than 10,000. So we're just going to cut the check to the homeowner for 10 grand and they're going to have to deal with the rest. That's like, first mm. off, horrible customer service. Second off, yeah. w- w- <laughs> but the water came first. They have water damage up to policy limit. So shouldn't they be covered under the water damage? I understand the physical treatment part of mold removal is separate and apart from that, but shouldn't they at right. least get the demolition, You know, the replacement of their items that got soaking wet and damaged as a result under the water damage? And then you have a $10,000 max right under the mold removal part to do the physical mold remediation. Mm -hmm. So I always have this argument and depending on, I think in a court of law, I think that argument's a sound one, but unfortunately you don't want to sue your insurance company. I mean, you don't want to sue anybody. It's a costly endeavor in and of itself, you know? So it's like having to do that. And then just to get covered is like almost ridiculous. So you end up getting stuck. Now, enter the friendly neighborhood public adjuster 
which is mm-hmm. kind of like hiring your own attorney and they get a percentage of whatever they get you. Now, when they come in and fight for your behalf, typically they know that this guy knows his stuff legally. So they can't really pull the wool over your eyes on right. that regard. So I always recommend if you have an insurance claim, just hire a public adjuster. Could it also be looking at your policy? Maybe 10000 for mold coverage is very low. Like that's the bottom oh, yeah. that you could have, you know, so maybe it could go up to 50,000 so that you would be able to have enough to get your items replaced. Because like you said, $10,000, that might not even be enough to cover the mold remediation. So, out so of the, again, going back to your policy and making sure your policy is kind of up to date. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I recommend bumping up your mold remediation coverage as much as you possibly can, because you mm-hmm. never know. You'd rather have it and not right. need it then not have it and need it. Right. Because (laughs) I mean, I can tell you out of the 10 projects I've done this month, only one of them was less than $10,000. So 19 of them would have had to come out of pocket if they weren't properly covered. Right. So that's a big figure. It's typically much more, but especially if you've had those five to 10 sources, it's five to 10 areas that you have to remediate, which are Mm. basically projects in and of themselves. Right. So you have to look at that. You want to make sure you're properly covered. The other situation is it has to be a covered loss. So they're, mm-hmm. they're very yes. crafty the way they write their insurance policies. <laughs> you know, it's like you have to like be standing on your left foot with one eye open at, you know, this exact hour to get coverage. Like it's almost that On ridiculous. this particular day of the week. <laughs> it's insane. But basically it's like, if this happens, you're covered. And it's like, okay, so what about if you have a leak, right? What if you have an appliance leak? Well, only if the appliance leaked here, not here. Mm, it's like, what does yeah. that mean, right? They, they carefully write it because they know if they write it a certain way, they're going to save money, right? And, right? and let's be honest, an insurance company, their objective is to make money. Any business in America, I don't care what it is, the objective is you have a fiduciary responsibility to make money. Otherwise, if you don't, you won't be there to service anybody, right? Exactly. So, there's supposed to be a give and take. I think if the insurance company, and this is, I'm writing a second book. This is why I'm talking about this. Yeah, Insurance is a big part of the second book. If the insurance company spent a little more time educating people, they could save money. I feel like Mm -hmm. you could save money with educating people not to make the mistakes that cause havoc. Right. Instead of, instead of limiting them when they need you. Right. And I feel like that's where we we really miss the mark. If I were a lobbyist, I'd be lobbying for change there. You know, yes, you were so right. You were so right because it's it's not that people don't want to do the right thing, it's that they just don't know. When I moved into this house, I literally walked around for probably about two months with this ball of anxiety in my stomach. What if something breaks? What what do I do? But if there was something that people got when they moved into the house and they knew, what are all the things that I need to make sure that I'm current on? Because you know, even with insurance companies you had spoken about what they're going to cover and what they don't cover. Well, if you weren't servicing, let's say your HVAC or something like that, and something happens, they're like, oh, well, you weren't getting routine maintenance done on that. Or maybe your refrigerator was too old. I mean, we can't cover that. You know what I'm saying? So if people knew exactly what they needed to do, I think they would do it. Yes, so I agree. Would, I, it's all about prevention, really. Prevention, right. I mean, honestly, uh, what do they say? An ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure or something like that. Yes. Right? I, I think we've seen that in the pandemic too, like wear your mask, wash your hands, right? All that stuff. Prevent is, is really effective. It's same thing with houses. You're supposed to spend 4% of your home's value every year in maintaining your home. That's wow. that, that is the number that you're supposed to spend. Really? No Ooh. way do we spend that. I know I don't spend that, right? I almost wish that when you bought a house and and this should happen, like the home insurance companies that you insure with should give you a we we are now insuring your house. This is your guidebook to yes. protecting your home, right? Because even yes. if you're covered, who wants to go through a remediation or a water mitigation, right? Nobody. Who no. wants to have to go buy new stuff and deal with all of that, like move out of their house? Nobody wants to deal with that. So I feel like if everybody got a book like that when they first mm-hmm. you know, bought a house or even moved into a rental, right? Mm-hmm. They would be like, oh, I, I'll do all of this stuff because I definitely do not want to have to deal with the consequences of not doing it. People give us the keys to a house and say, good luck. You know, that's, that's the thing. Good luck. <laughs> You know, yes. it's like, and here's you know, a, here's a coffee maker. 
<laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You only think about decorating it, but you don't think about all the other things that you have right. to do. In fact, episode, I believe it might've been episode nine, we were talking about termites and the guy that I had on, he was a wonderful guest. He's actually my bug guy. And he had said, every home that you buy, it's not a matter of if you're going to get termites, it's a matter of when. Right. And if you take that preventive measure and just get a routine inspection every year, every two years, and just treat your house, you won't get to the point where you've got thousands of dollars of damage from termites that you didn't know until they came through the drywall. Like what you right. were saying, you might have mold behind the drywall, but you don't see it. You may not see it until it's really bad and it's coming through the drywall. So. Right. I'm glad that you had come on because it's driving home this idea of maintaining and prevention. And I really wish that I had taken more. I'm getting goosebumps as I'm talking about it because I see the, the air of my own ways by not yeah. doing more things to prevent some of the problems that we've had in this house. Or even at the very beginning, when we came to look at the house and put our names on the contract, like, what do you mean you didn't get a mold remediation? There was someone that was supposed to be in here and we didn't do that. There's so many more things we could talk about, but I know that we're just over time, but you have so many more things in your book that I highly, highly, highly recommend everyone to get this. It is on Amazon. And I know that you do have a website. There's some other things that you talk about with preventing what to do when you find mold, but you also even go into taking care of your health and the reasons why some people have more symptoms because of leaky gut. And some people just have these damaged immune systems that make them more perceptible is that the word I'm looking for? I think that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> susceptible, yeah, susceptible. Susceptible, that's the word I'm looking yeah. for. And, and, uh, and more susceptible to mold and environmental damage. Yeah, yeah, and there's individuals that are carriers of the HLA-DR gene, which mm -hmm. is, people call it the mold gene as a nickname. But yeah. you know, if you're a carrier of that gene, you're not methylating. And basically, you're not detoxifying the way you mm. normally should. And so these particles that enter your bloodstream, they just start to you know accumulate and accumulate. and they just don't detoxify. So you literally are just adding so much inflammation to your body until you just get really sick. And so, you know, th this other thing about is any, when you have an overload of particles and mold just happens to be, you know, one of the easiest things to enter our homes as far as contamination oh, yes. goes. But when you have a lot, an overload of particles, it does it react to that anti-inflammatory response in our bodies because it adds so much inflammation having these particles in your body. You start to develop fat around the organs. You're holding on to water. You're trying to basically dilute the toxicity of your body. I mean, and your body's in a- conditions too. Yeah. Auto yeah I mean, you're, well. It's true. Yeah. If you have any sort of autoimmune disease disorder, any pre-existing conditions, it's just going to exacerbate the problems mm -hmm. and make it so that you're not healing one thing because you have this constant attack from these right. particles in your environment. It's crazy. Like you said earlier, the COVID has definitely increased the awareness of air quality because we know that the main transmission oh, yes. of COVID-19 is through the air. And so we've all become more conscious of air quality. We're wearing masks, but you know we're not wearing masks indoors, nor should we need to. But we do have to be concerned right. about the air that we're breathing. I'll leave you with this. You know, the average person takes 20,000 breaths per day. That's a mm. lot of air, right? You're consuming more air than you are water, more food. But what's interesting is, considering we consume more air, I find it very odd that we never look at air quality in terms of optimizing our health, right? Like we're, if we're sick, we're like, oh, we, we got to drink more water, take more vitamins or eat better food. We never say we got to breathe better air. And it's like mind boggling yes. to me because we know that's the number one thing that comes into our bodies. Yes. I, I did have one other question that came up sure. since we are talking about improving our air. What do you think about using some of these air purifiers? Do they work or are there certain types that work better than others? Or are they just spewing things back into the environment? Is it, is it something that's really helping us improve our air quality since we know we need to do that? I, I do like them. It's like, you know, if you drink filtered water, you're filtering the contaminants out of water before you drink it. It, it makes sense to filter your air because you want to be able to open the window every now and then enjoy some fresh air, get a nice cross breeze, right? You're going to have pollen. You're going to have allergens. You're going to have things come into the environment. I think it's good to mm -hmm. have a process that filters our air. You could do the same air purification system with inside your HVAC. I love this system. It's a IntelliPure system. It's called the Healthway Super V. It's, 
it's a heftier purchase than a typical $20 filter. It's a $2,500 component, but it lasts mm. three years. You don't have to change your filters for three years. You install that on your machine and it turns your HVAC into an air purifier, which is amazing so you're because- treating, you're, So the whole house is the getting- The whole house, Not right. just your living room and your bedroom, which is where we have them now. <laughs> considering those one little units can be hundreds of dollars, spending one amount to have the whole house done. And it acts as a second thing too. It stops mold from being able to get to that coil and contaminate the HVAC system. Mm -hmm. So it does two purposes in one. I love that And what is that called again? What is that called? called It's called IntelliPures, the manufacturer, the Healthway Super V. Okay. I love it. I love it because it filters out as small as seven nanometers, which is roughly the size of a virus, by the way. Oh. So in terms of technology for a homeowner, you, you can't find better specs out there. I think it's good to, to filter your air just like you would filter your water. I think it's an important. I think that the one caveat to that is if you have a mold problem, the solution is not put air purifiers everywhere. It's to remove mm. the mold. So just keep remove that in mind. You want to have it as a supplementation or another line of defense, you don't want it to be the band-aid solution that Got solves it. your remediation issue. This has been such a great interview. I, I enjoyed, you know, I really enjoyed talking about mold. <laughs> I know you said at the beginning, you were like, hey, isn't everybody excited about mold? But no, it actually was a really good interview. And I think there's things that people are going to be able to do now, even just going and checking their toilet lids to see if there's mold underneath yeah. of there. So um, again, your book is called The Mold Medic, An Expert's Guide on Mold Removal, Michael Rubino. Where can people find you? Where are you most active? I'm most active on Instagram. That's my favorite via of communication, I would say, in terms of social media. If you go on Instagram, at The Mold Medic, I do have a Facebook, Michael Rubino, the author page on there as well, where I'm pretty active. Most of my Instagram posts make it on there. Um, So if you're not on Instagram and you're on Facebook, it's another good way to follow me. And then go to allamericanrestoration.com. There's a ton of free information on there, such as how do I find a good mold inspector? How do mm. I find a good mold remediator? There's some checklists on there and things like that. The history of mold. If you're curious about mold, I've put together a timeline of when we first thought mold was discovered to where we are today and all the lawsuits in between that have changed some mm. of the ways that we do things. So it's a pretty cool little thing I put together and the moldmedic.com. If you're interested in looking at the book, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So if you have the nook and you want to get it on there, go ahead and pick that up on Barnes and Noble. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to tell everybody to get this book. The link will be down below. All the show notes links will be down there, but I highly recommend people read this. It only took me probably about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. And I was taking notes as well. <laughs> It's a short read. It's only 150 pages and it's written. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I didn't write it in complicated terminology. It's not I complicated wanted, at all. It's I really- wanted people to really be able to understand it. So I, I try to write it as simple as possible. It's a, it's a very quick and easy read and it's very informative. Yeah. Well, when you're done your next book, we'll have to have you come back. Yes. Talk about the insurance yeah, I'm in the middle company of that. aspect. I'm about yes. 30% through, I think. So <laughs> Well, good luck on that. Thank you so much, Michael. And I look forward to having you come back again. Thank you for joining us. Likewise. Thanks for having me. So if you're like me, you probably got done listening to this, went around your home to each bathroom, pulled off the top cover and checked to see if there was mold there, right? (laughs) Well, that's a good start. I think what this episode has taught me is that we need to take mold seriously. And also, if there's any times when you do have any water intrusion, maybe a toilet flooded and you've got some wet drywall or some wet floors, the main thing is to treat it right away. Instead of doing what I know that I've done in the past is to just put your head in the sand and think, well, it's going to go away. It's not really that big of a deal. It's just a little bit of wet drywall. No, we need to be more proactive. And I think that's why this podcast is so important because we're not just talking about decorating and improving. We're actually talking about the maintenance things that we have to do and we can't ignore those things. And I know for myself, since we've lived here 10 years, there's a lot of maintenance things that I ignored for years because I was afraid it would cost too much money. I would be afraid there'd be more problems that would arise and I just didn't want to deal with it. But I think listening to this, we can all be certain that if we are proactive, and I think this is a general theme that's come out of all these episodes, if we are more preventive and proactive with our homes, we are more likely to identify problems 
before they even begin (laughs) to even just prevent them. Or if there is a problem, then we're catching it when it's not a huge problem. Because as we've seen in other episodes, when you wait till something gets to be a huge problem, it's more expensive. So even though the preventive is also expensive, just imagine it can be three, four, five, six times as much once it gets to an advanced stage. So let's be more proactive in our homes. Let's be more preventive and let's do some of these maintenance things. So definitely get the book, The Mold Medic. You can find the link down below. I highly recommend it and just be vigilant in your home and make sure that if you do have a water intrusion or a water leak, handle it right away. Don't assume that once it dries out, everything is okay. (laughs) That's not the case. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode and that you're finding these episodes to be valuable, that there's something you're learning in these episodes that you're applying to your life, to your home. So I would love to know. You can send me an email. You can hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, any of those places you can use hashtag thrift diving podcast and I will see it and let me know, are you getting something valuable from this? Is there something that you learned that you were able to apply to your home, to your life? I would love to know. It helps keep me going. Sometimes, like I said, it feels like I'm talking to myself, (laughs) but sometimes people will email me and say, no, you're not talking to yourself. I'm listening. So it's always great to hear back from you. I love it. And you can also give me a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, anywhere you listen to podcasts, go ahead and give me a review. Leave some feedback there. I'd love to hear it. Next episode, episode 16, we are talking about seven thrift tips that I have learned over the years at the thrift store. So if you remember, we talked a little bit about some thrift tips on episode seven with Jamela Wallace, but we're going to be talking about more thrift tips next week, just you and me. So be sure to come back for episode 16 so that we can talk about thrift stores and just leave all the mold and bugs behind for just a little bit. (laughs) All right, I will see you next episode.